Today, we're gonna to take you on a journey through the narrow cobbled streets of Florence, the same streets where Michelangelo, Machiavelli, Leonardo, and the other well-known members of the Medici family walked in the 1400s, a time known as the Renaissance. We will also explore how a German monk challenged the most powerful authority in all of Europe and changed the course of history in a time known as the Age of Reformation. Hi, my name is Katie. And I'm Todd, and we're excited to learn with you today. Welcome to AP Live. We're really glad that you're here with us. The purpose of these AP Live review sessions is to supplement your course learning from throughout the year in AP European history. And so we're gonna explore essential content in each lesson while providing assignments for you to practice for the upcoming AP European history exam. We encourage you to submit your assignments and a few will be selected each day and we'll provide important feedback to help everyone better understand how to be successful on the exam. And finally, we want these review sessions to help you feel a sense of community with students like yourself from across the country and international schools around the world. We have all experienced a challenging year. Together, we can focus on learning and doing well on this year's exam. So let's take a learning for this week in our learning plan. And today, obviously, is Monday the 19th. And so our content review is going to be Renaissance and Reformations. And the skill development that we're going to be unpacking for you today, we're going to analyze primary sources. We have a map and an image for you. And those are going to be done through a short answer question. And so your homework choice tonight will be to do the SAQ with a map or the SAQ with an image. And if you want to knock yourself out and do both, you can do that as well. One thing, though, that I want to make sure that you're looking at is that what we have coming up for the rest of the week, you can see on Tuesday, we got absolutism, constitutionalism. We've got scientific revolution and enlightenment on Wednesday, French revolution, Napoleonic era Thursday. And if you take a look down at the homework choice, you're going to see that we are offering different types of choices for you to get at uh, the different ways that you're going to be uh, assessed on the AP exam. The other thing I want to say is please try to subscribe to our AP Live reviews. Uh, that helps us as well. And like us if you're liking us. All right. So we're starting in those cobblestone streets that Todd was talking about during the opening. And I want you to take a look at the beautiful picture of Florence that you can see on the screen there as we move in to talk about the historical development that is on the right hand side. So Italian Renaissance humanists, including Petrarch, promoted a revival in classical literature and created new philological approaches to ancient texts. Some Renaissance humanists furthered the values of secularism and individualism. All right, next slide, Todd. Thank you. And there's Petrarch. And so the Renaissance is characterized by a deep interest in looking back at ancient Greek and Roman literature and philosophy from which new ideas about humans and human nature were developed. And this interest in the classical past began in the 14th century with Petrarch. And you can see him there on the right. He believed that he was living in a new era where writers and artists would bring forward the glory of a classical past. He advocated for a kind of classical scholarship that would become the intellectual centerpiece for the Renaissance called humanism. This program of study emphasized the critical study of Latin and Greek literature while it valued the worthiness of human nature and human accomplishments. So really important to see that word human in humanism. It's really central to understanding. Along with promoting a revival in classical texts, some Renaissance humanists furthered the values of secularism and individualism. And these values are closely intertwined with humanism. Humanists focused their attention on the present and less on the afterlife that was so important during the Middle Ages. So very secular, worldly, and similarly, individualism becomes a prominent theme in Italy. Philosophers wrote about the potential of man and developed their own beliefs on the kind of person an individual should aim to be. All right, so that brings us to another uh, historical development. And that is that the admiration for Greek and Roman political institutions supported a revival of civic humanist culture in the Italian city-states and produced secular models for individual and for political behavior. 
So let's look at some examples of those. So before we start, you can see there's this portrait. We're gonna talk in a, a minute about Castiglione, but this is a portrait by Raphael. And when I started the year, and I know for many of you, this feels like a long time ago. You probably covered the Renaissance back in August or September. So this feels very far away. So you have a lot of review to do. And so we wanna take a minute and talk about the fact that Todd and I are not gonna cover all of the topics in unit one or two. And in fact, in any of the units over our next two weeks together. So please know that we've kind of hit some highlights from each unit. But for example, this is one of, I tell my students at the beginning of the year, the so-called Ninja Turtles from Italian Renaissance art. And um, we're not gonna cover that in our lesson today, but there are uh, AP daily videos that you can absolutely go back and look at if you need a reminder of review of the different content, not only the, the things that Todd and I cover, but also the things that we're not gonna cover. All right, so as we're looking kind of co contextualizing these models of behavior for much of the Renaissance, the powerful Medici family ruled Florence from behind the scenes Lorenzo the Magnificent was known as an advocate of civic humanism. These ideas were from ancient Greece and civic humanism was the belief that it was an intellectual civic duty to be involved in politics and to help the community. So civic humanism is a very active concept you have to do in your community. All right, so examples for, of these models and I just picked a couple uh, for individual and, and political behavior that I like to cover with my students. Your teachers might have done something different but here we have Castiglione, and one example for a secular model for individual behavior can be found in his book of the Courtier. This was a training manual of sorts for the ideal gentleman, as well as a how-to book for someone wanting to climb socially. It described the broad academic background a gentleman should have, along with physical fitness and skills in many disciplines like music, math, and dance. It was translated into many languages, widely read throughout Europe. It was a bestseller and Castiglione gets his portrait painted by Raphael there on the right. And then I'm sure many of you might remember from the beginning of the year talking about Machiavelli's The Prince. It's really the best example for a model of political behavior. In it, he used classical and current examples to argue about the qualities needed for effective rulers. And he, after personally living through the power struggles in Florence for over two decades, so these are not the only examples that your teachers might have uh, kind of covered with you, but I wanted to give you a couple of examples that matched what the course and exam description wanted you to know. Those must know things. All right, so the Italian Renaissance moves to the North. And so I want you to kind of have us look together at this idea of Christian humanism, which was embodied in the writings of Erasmus employed Renaissance learning in the service of religious reform. Actually, Todd, I'm gonna to have you go back really quickly. I don't know why that circle was there. Um, so if you guys will just follow along with me at the one on the top, we'll come back to, to the other um, concept there. So we have the Northern Renaissance that retains a more religious focus. The Northern Renaissance, I want you to see some continuities and changes. And that results in a more human-centered naturalism that considers individuals and everyday life appropriate objects of artistic representation. So sorry about that. We'll come back to Christian humanism in just a minute. And Todd, if you'll go to the next slide, I've done a chart to kind of uh, do continuities and changes between Italian Renaissance art and Northern Renaissance art. So, and then if you look really quickly on the right, you see that if you're looking for some examples of this art, these are the AP Daily videos you can check out. If this is just feeling like it was really far away in the course and you want a little specific information. So first, who's paying for the art? In the Italian Renaissance, we have the Catholic Church that's paying for the art, wealthy aristocratic families like the Medicis are paying for the art. And as we move to the North, we have wealthy merchants and monarchs that are our big patrons, the people who pay for the artists to do their work. As we move down, we look at what's being depicted in the art. And we definitely see some changes as we move from Italy into the North. Uh, Italy has very um, classical figures from mythology in ancient Greece and Rome, as well as religious figures and scenes. And as we move to the North, we see a huge shift. We see peasants, normal people in their everyday lives. We see portraits and nature, domestic interiors, 
and we see fewer nudes than we saw during the Italian Renaissance. Continuing on, we look at the materials and focus of the art. So it makes sense that in Italy, we have the things that are easily found. Um, we have fresco paints, we have uh, tempera paints, as well as marble. Marble is plentiful in Italy, and as we move to the north, it's not plentiful. So we're gonna see other mediums, oil on panel and wood, and a shift from a focus on scientific principles like proportion, anatomy, and perspective into a focus on color and detail. However, there are continuities. There are some things that stay the same. And so if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, we, we definitely continue with religious subject matters. Uh, both Italian and Northern Renaissance art use perspective. And we have the employing of naturalism and realism in both of the uh, art movements. All right, and our last one, sorry, now we're here at Christian humanism, hopefully. Um, so Christian humanism, again, uh, employs religious learning in the service, uh, Renaissance learning in the service of religious reform. So as we look at this last slide for the Renaissance, um, we'll start with Thomas More. He's an English humanist and he wrote Utopia in 1516. And in this, he describes an island outside of Europe where all children receive an education in the Greek and Roman classics and where problems such as poverty and discord have been solved by the government. There is religious toleration and no dissent or disagreement. So that's where we get that word utopia, right? Or a perfect society. And this is how this humanist envisioned that, a combination of religious toleration and ancient Greek and Roman ideals. And then we get to the person mentioned in that key concept and that's Erasmus. He's known as the Prince of Humanists. He's the most famous of the Northern humanists and he becomes a famous reformer. He wants to unite the classical ideals that were important in Italy, like humanism and civic virtue, with Christian ideas from the Bible, such as love and piety. He wanted to look not only to classical sources, but also to ancient original Christian sources from church fathers. So Erasmus creates a Greek version of the New Testament and a very famous satire that criticized religious and political institutions in his The Praise of Folly. He believes that education was the key to all reform and that his church had strayed from the ideals it should have been following. And he also created a new Latin translation of the New Testament actually in 1516, the same year that Thomas More wrote Utopia. So we have a quote here at the end and I actually don't know who this quote is attributed to, maybe Todd knows, but it's kind of one that we talk about when we're in class and maybe your teacher used it with you, that Erasmus laid the egg and Martin Luther hatched it. This idea that Erasmus begins in the praise of folly, sort of criticizing religious and political institutions and Martin Luther kind of just grabs it and runs with it. So I think that that hands it off to Todd to talk a little bit about the Protestant Reformation. I am aware of the quote, but I am not sure who the quote should be attributed to. Okay, so here we're going to shift over to the age of Reformation. And I want to talk about how and why these religious belief and practices changed from 1450 to 1648. So that's period one in European history. And we're looking at, you know, what's going on currently and then how does this change? And we're going to talk about some of these reformers. So Martin Luther, John Calvin are going to be some of the reformers we talk about. You may have also learned about some of the Anabaptists as well. There's that. And now, so let's go talk about, as we get into this period of reform, what is the church like as we head into this? So the condition of the church, and we think about different historical thinking skills, we're talking about contextualization. So in the early 16th century, the Catholic church is the center of life for all social classes throughout Europe. And most people were very, were deeply pious, that is deeply faithful, uh, religiously regular, if you will, attending to religious study and doing things that they felt would help them enter heaven uh, through a, when, they, when that day came for them. A wide range of people had grievances, and that's a word that means we have, I have issues, I have concerns with the church. And educated lay people such as Christian humanists, who Katie just mentioned, and urban residents, villagers and artisans, and some church officials want some type of reform. So reform meaning change. We, we recognize this is our church, but we also would like to see some things get better. 
that are going on. And there are some things that we're going to point to that we don't think are, are good. So some of the signs and disorder and abuse in the Catholic Church at this time include clerical immorality. That is, we have a bunch of clerics throughout the country, and some of them aren't behaving like we expect clerics to behave. Clerical ignorance. One of the things you have to look at is kind of a cause-effect relationship here, because in the period prior to this, we've got the Black Death, the plague spreading throughout Europe. And those attending to those who were sick are clerics and nuns. And because they were attending to them, they also became sick and passed away. And what were needed then, the church had to kind of hurry up the education, if you will, of number of clerics and nuns and get them out to minister to the people. And in doing so, they were not ready. So there's kind of this idea of clerical ignorance. There's a lot of historical records of a cleric supposedly saying the mass in Latin, but they're mumbling through it and it's not Latin. And so that's a concern that people have. There is absenteeism and pluralism. And those two words are what you think they would be. Absenteeism meaning if I'm assigned to this area and I'm not showing up, that's one of them. And then pluralism meaning if I'm assigned to one area, but I'm also assigned to another, and I'm taking uh, wages, I guess, if you will, from those two dioceses, if you will, um, that was also really, really frowned upon, and they felt that something wasn't wasn't quite kosher up, on the up and up with that. There are also privileges. So, as clerics, you're you're not the church doesn't have to pay taxes necessarily. They might pay an annual tithe to the king, depending on the land, but they have a lot of privileges that everyday common people in these villages and throughout Europe don't have. And so some see that as an abuse that they want to have remedied in some way. So this image you're looking at is of Pope Julius II, and you see the dates till 1513. He held the office of Pope from, until his death. And so he's kind of the one dealing, supposed, supposedly having to deal with some of these changes that the church is going through. Now we're gonna talk about a man named Martin Luther, and we're gonna talk quickly about the illustration. This is a Dominican preacher, Johann Tetzel, selling indulgences inside a church. So indulgences is kind of a, a central theme of Luther's change and reformation and push. And so this is an image I thought was pretty good because um, most of the images of Tetzel that I've seen aren't, aren't quite within this, but you see this, this line of faithful coming through. You see the man putting coins on a table, receiving a script or a piece of paper, some, telling him they're going to be absolved of these particular sins. So Martin Luther is an, is an Augustinian monk who through his study of the New Testament came to believe that salvation is obtained by faith alone. And he believed that scriptures revealed God to people, not the traditions of the Catholic church. This is really an important topic here because Luther was a Catholic monk, and he was doing all these things to try and make sure that he wanted to assurances that he would be saved, that he would have salvation. And none of these things that he was attempting to never really felt like it's going to ever be enough. And he's looking through the letters of, of St. Paul, and, he, and it comes to him that really it's about making sure that I am faithful to God. And if I am faithful to God, then I am going to receive salvation. And because he says that, he says it's really scripture reveals in God's to people, not these traditions and, uh, uh, and different things that are going on within the church itself. And you can think that that's going to be, feel threatening if you're the church. So during his time, Pope Leo X then is going to authorize a special indulgence. And you can see them collecting money here. And that indulgence is to finance the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This is a big project that's going on as a part of the Renaissance. And so in German states, these sales were run by the Dominican friar, Johann Tetzel, who promised through that the purchase of the indulgence would bring full forgiveness of one's sins or, or the sins of a loved one from purgatory. And he famously said, when a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So it's like a modern day marketing campaign to help build use the money to help build this magnificent uh, cathedral that becomes uh, St. Peter's in Rome. And so here you have this image. And as first time I've seen this image, I kind of collected it and I was like, I kind of like it. It's a little cartoonish, but you see the, the anxiety on Luther's face as he's nailing the 95 theses to the door, church door at Wittenberg. 
in Germany and the concern of the onlookers, if you will. So I was kind of attracted to the animation of the, of the, of the image itself. So he is, this is deeply troubling. The, the idea of indulgence is deeply troubling to Luther. And so he wrote these 95 theses, these different arguments or grievances that he has, the things that he believes, claims that he thinks should happen to reform the church. And he, he taxed them into the stories, he taxed them to the church door at Wittenberg on October 31st on All Hallows' Eve in 1517. They're quickly printed in both Latin and Germany and widely disseminated. Um, yes, the, the, the printing press has plays a role in spreading this information. Luther continues to write, urging reforms in the church. His works were quickly condemned by Rome and he is threatened with excommunication. This is, this is something that's very, very serious, especially in this time. And so in 1521, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time was Charles V. He is a Habsburg, and he's going to call a diet or an assembly of notable. A diet is like a, a big meeting in the city of Worms in Germany. And he calls Luther to appear. And Luther does appear, and he has the debate, and he refuses to recant the, the arguments that he's been making in the 95 Theses. And after the diet of Worms, the religious division in the in German states continued, and Charles V is going to agree eventually after a, a great deal of, uh, uh, we're, we're walking through this rather quickly. He'll eventually agree to the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, which officially recognizes Protestantism. And it's going to allow the German princes of those lands to choose between Catholicism and Lutheranism. One thing to keep in mind, and this is a big deal because there are almost 400 different principalities throughout the German lands. And so each German prince then gets to choose which type of faith they want to follow. And there's an economic aspect to that, dis that decision as well. All right, so let's talk about further reformers. And I have a map for you. I know it's really busy and the, the legend at the top is really small, but really the big picture look here is, do we see change occurring in Europe, okay? So all these different colors represent different types of reform that are taking place in Europe that were Catholic, okay? And so um, you're seeing kind of this purplish, it's a mixed in Bohemia and Austria, a mix of Catholic and Protestant areas. Um, this darker purple in Switzerland is mostly Calvinist. We're gonna read it, we're gonna talk quickly about John Calvin and the changes he made in Geneva, Switzerland. This kind of orangish salmon-y color is mostly Lutheran, turning to Lutheranism. Um, and the yellows uh, are kind of the areas that stay the same, stay Catholic. And these, these purples are again, a mix that you see in the Netherlands. Uh, in the Netherlands, you got the Northern part is going Lutheran. The Southern part is remaining Catholic. Those are lands held by the Habsburgs. And then you see the Scandinavian countries all switch to Lutheranism. So the map is really intended to show you this big sweeping change that's occurring throughout. So the first area outside of Germany to officially accept the Reformation is the Kingdom of Denmark Norway under King Christian III. And so while the process of conversion went smoothly and quickly in Denmark, it gra happened gradually, more gradually in Norway and in Iceland uh, because of some resistance from the people. In Sweden, it's Gustavus Vasa who helps bring Protestantism into the region. And then proceeding from the idea of God's absolute sovereignty, you have, and, and God's omnipotence, you have John Calvin, another reformer, who concludes a little differently than Luther. He says, human beings could do nothing to save themselves. Whereas Luther said, you know, if I'm reading scripture and I'm, it, I, I, I can do that and that will help me get into the good place. God decides at the beginning of time who's going to be saved is what Gal Calvin believed. And that is the idea of predestination. Calvin and his city government of Geneva in Switzerland attempt to regulate people's conduct in order to create a godly city on earth. And so it is, is kind of, done by the by the thinking of the of scripture and by the the government itself and so they ban card playing dancing any other forms of recreational activity so it's a very rigid look at how the people behave in the city of geneva and another reformer knox who studied with calvin in geneva he's instrumental in creating the scottish parliament to set up a calvinist church as the official state church of scotland which becomes more known as Presbyterian. So we look over at the map and you can see that kind of mostly Calvinists, dark, that lighter lavender purple 
is how Scotland turns. And again, the idea is to see this big sweeping sets of changes and reforms that are happening uh, within a very short period of time, actually, uh, throughout the 15th century. All right. All right. So let's review. And actually, before we start talking about the SAQ, I just want to remind again, if you notice the country that was in pink, uh, we didn't even talk about the uh, English Reformation. So to remind you that there's so much that we're not able to cover. And so Henry VIII, and I am sure usually students, my students, I think really like the um, Anglican Reformation, the English Reformation. So we are not covering everything about the Protestant Reformation in this quick blurb that we went through. And, and Todd hit it, we danced through it very, very quickly. So today we're really gonna focus on the short answer question, both um, for the paper and pencil exam and the digital exam. Um, this is the part of the AP test that you take after the multiple choice, right? You have the 55 multiple choice questions in 55 minutes. And then you're gonna do a set here now of short answer questions. So for those of you coming up to that first administration that's gonna be paper and pencil, you're gonna write a total of three questions. You have 40 minutes to write the three questions and it, come, it will come to 20% of the points that you're able to get on the AP exam. The first question you're gonna do is required. Everyone writes question number one. It includes either one or two secondary sources. And coming up in a future uh, review, we're going to do a whole thing on secondary sources. That's going to be next week. And it's going to focus on the historical developments or processes from the year 1600 through the year 2001. So some of what we just covered, it's, it's not going to be in there because everything pretty much that Todd and I just talked about is mostly before 1600 um, and stopping at 2001. So that's question one. And everyone who takes the paper and pencil exam will write that one. Question two is also required, and this is gonna be a primary source. It's gonna focus on the same time period between 1600 and 2001. And for that one, it, it might be a primary source text, it might be an image, uh, but it will be a primary source for question two. So on the paper and pencil exam, the students that take that first administration will get a choice. You're gonna choose between question three and question four. So for both of these questions, there is no stimulus. They are just a text-based uh, question. And it's gonna focus that first question three on historical developments that cover from 1450 to 1648, which is period one in AP Euro, and or from 1648 to 1815, which is period two. Question four is gonna be the later part of the course. It's gonna be 1815 to 1914 and or 1914 to the present. So students get to choose which question between question three and four they prefer. There is no source and they only write one of these two and they can read them both and make the choice which one that they wanna, they wanna answer. Thanks, Katie. So for the digital exam, um, the, the SAQ, this part, the section B short answer part, you will have three questions. You'll have 40 minutes. It is 20% of the score. So you can see it is compared to the paper pencil. Um, question one then is a required one and it includes one primary source text. Focuses on historical developments or processes between 1600 and 2001. So you're getting a primary source and it's a piece of text and you have to, well, the one that's sent to you, that's the one you must answer. Well, it's the only one that will be in front of you for question one. Question two is required as well, and it will be a map source. It focuses on historical developments or processes between the years of 1450 and 2001. And so we are gonna give you a map source as a practice today, but um, just know that question two is required. You won't have any choice there and it will be a map. Question three is also required. This is a difference between the paper, pencil, and the digital, is that those are doing paper, pencil are going to have this choice here between two questions between an earlier or later period. But in the digital exam, you're going to have one sent to you. It's question three. It'll include one primary source image. And it focuses on historical developments or processes between years 1450 and 2001. And we have one of those for you to practice on as well today. So we wanted to show you a little bit of the differences between whether you're taking the first administration, which is paper pencil, or that second administration, or the th actually third administration, which will be the digital exam, that there is a slight difference, even though they're going to count for the same amount of score. And, you know, as we're looking at an example, it's also kind of good to note that for the people who are taking the digital exam, 
in the later part of the exam, after the document-based question, there are two other uh, SAQs that the digital administration is gonna have students write. And one of those will be a secondary source uh, SAQ, like what, what we had just talked about for the people taking the pencil and paper, as well as a data set SAQ. But those will not be at the beginning of the exam, those will instead be at the end. All right, so let's unpack the SAQ. Um, it is a really straightforward task. And I think it's probably the thing my own students will say is the, the most straightforward, the easiest to understand. Uh, there's not a complicated rubric, and we're going to go over rubrics for other parts of the exam. But it is a really straightforward task that will assess content knowledge <clears throat> and skills. Each part, um, there's each SAQ has three parts, and uh, each part is one point. We're going to first look at the um, the prompts and identify the task verb that is used for each part. So you're going to see one of two task verbs here that have kind of a different level that you need to be familiar with. So the entry level task is describe. And for describing, you're really gonna provide the characteristics of a specific topic. You're gonna tell us what happened, for example. Uh, you don't need to go into a tremendous amount of depth for a describe, whereas as we move to the next one for explain, we are digging deeper. It is a more complex, task. So you provide information about how or why a relationship, a process, a pattern, position, situation, or outcome occurs using evidence and or reasoning. So it goes beyond just describing that you're not only going to tell us what happened, but you're going to go deeper and tell us how it happened, why it happened, what caused it to happen because of how it happened. So definitely you want to be mindful of the task verb and doing what's necessary to get the point on these three-part short answer questions. As you're responding to the short answer question, there is kind of a practice or method you should use. So one of the things that we want you to do, or we encourage you to do, is to label each part. So you're gonna see the parts are listed A, and there's a task that you have to do, B, there's a task, and C, there's a task. And in your response, it is helpful to readers if you label A, B, C. And I also think it really helps you focus while you're in the exam. Okay, this is what I'm, resp I'm responding to A, and so this is my response, and B, and so forth. We encourage you to use the stem of the prompt to begin your response to the prompt, to begin how you respond to the prompt, okay? So when responding to explain prompts, be, and also, as this is what Katie just talked about, be sure to include the how, why, or because. So an example would be explain how the historical situation in England led to political change in the 1500s, okay? So we're definitely talking about um, like English reformation. And your sample would be, as I'm writing my sample response, you see the purple, I'm gonna use the, the stem of the prompt in my response to the prompt. So I would say the historical situation in England led to political change in the 1500s because or due to and then put in my response. And if I even have more to say or can give some specific example or specific evidence who was involved, that is gonna bring you to, that, to that, that level that you'll get to earn the point, okay? So again, use that stem of the prompt to respond to the prompt. All right, and we're gonna be giving you kind of structure for writing throughout the whole week on the different parts. I know this is a pretty simple task compared to some of the other things we're gonna do, but we really like to provide you with some structure. So we've come up with two different potential practice SAQs for you to work with. And if you have a look at the image here, uh, this is a Bruegel, this is the Harvesters, and he is a Northern Renaissance painter from the Netherlands. And so I'm not gonna, the, a part of me wants to dig into the image with you, but instead that's your homework is to kind of dig into the image and have a look knowing who this is. Um, if you need to go back to AP Daily, um, he is covered in the Northern Renaissance art video. And so let's have a look at our SAQ that kind of goes with this. And it's a continuity and change SAQ. And it starts off with that entry level task of describing. So um, you're gonna describe how the subject of the painting, so what do you see that's going on in the painting? And how does that reflect a continuity with everyday life from the period of the middle of the 15th century, which is when the course starts, to the mid 17th century? 
So you're gonna tell me, you're gonna describe how the subject of the painting reflects that. For the B task, we're going deeper. We're going to explain and explain how the subject of the painting reflects artistic movements during the 16th century. And so what do you know about art movements in the 16th century and what's going on here in the painting and how that relates to it? And so you're gonna give me the, the how, the why. And then the last task is to explain how patterns of European economic life as depicted in the painting will change after the 17th century. So we kind of started off with continuity, we're ending with change. Where are we going next and explaining how that changes, right? And giving me specific examples. The SAQs come from specific examples of evidence. We wanna be as specific as possible. So really good SAQ. Really good SAQ you developed there, Katie. That looks good. All right, so here, that was your practice number one or choice number one. Here is choice number two. And this is a map source. And it's not the best map. I kind of wish I could, you know, pinch it, make it bigger, um, but I wasn't allowed to crop this photo, but it's okay. You're kind of getting a broad view of the progress of the Reformation. You can see it. Um, and uh, we also, these are going to be available to you as well. we'll, we'll so you can kind of take a closer look. Um, but you're looking at a map of, progress of the Reformation, okay? Western and Central Europe, progress of the Reformation to 1560. So here's our A task. Describe how the historical situation in England led to political change in the 1500s. Political situation in England led to political change, historical situation led to political change in the 1500s. The B task is explain how the situation represented in the map demonstrates a change from the political situ situation in the German lands prior to 1500, okay? And the C task, explain how the situation represented in the map caused political change in France after 1560. So we're talking about different types of changes and you're kind of talking, it's a little causal, right? So cause effect relationships is kind of what we're looking at there and assessing there. Those are your two cho uh, choices for practice for homework for today. All right, so how do we get out the homework and how do I turn it in? So if you are interested in accessing SAQ practice number one, that's the image that Katie unpacked, there's a short URL or you can do this, the QR code and scan, and that will take you right to a document that is that, that SAQ. If you want to do the map that I just unpacked, there's a short URL there or a QR code you can scan, and that takes you right to the document that you can open up uh, that has that. So then when you are ready and you've written something, either you've typed something up or you have handwritten something, you've taken a picture of it, you can then turn in your homework and we have it on a Google form. So there's the tiny URL at the bottom, or you can scan it and I'm, it's going to open up to a Google form. And one of the things about the Google form is there, it's a little busy, uh, the form itself, and so, but there's only one, there's nothing really required on the form. So you're going to see, there's going to be some questions like, you know, was this helpful today? Or was this this? But if you were like, I just want to turn in my homework and you've written your homework, if you kind of scroll to the bottom of the form, there's a little add file button and that's where you upload uh, whatever homework you want to do. And then Katie and I are going to go through, we're going to select different practice, different homework, and we're going to bring that to tomorrow and unpack it and show you hey, this is going to earn the point because, this is going to earn the point because, and we're going to give lots of feedback based on this practice. Okay, Katie, you want to add anything there? Um, no, just that maybe they could, if they want, um, the Google form, I agree, there's a lot of questions that may not be relevant if all you want to do is the practice that we have for you. But if you do have questions, I can't promise that we're going to answer them on a daily basis, but if we see the same question coming up, we will make some time during these two weeks to make sure that we answer those questions or find out whatever the answers are that you need, particularly if they're about the administration or if they're about something specific to the course, of course, you can ask that too. I think that's all. Right. Thank you. Sure. All right, so what should we take away today? Um, so here's what we did today. We talked about Renaissance reformations really fast, but we also gave you some time to look at different skill development that talks about Analyzing these primary sources as a text and a map and how we would unpack and respond to an SAQ. And so your homework choice is the SAQ with a map or the SAQ with an image. Tomorrow, we're going to go into absolutism and constitutionalism, and we're going to talk about your skill development. We're going to talk about contextualization and thesis, 
and we're going to give you um, a DBQ and an LEQ prompt, and the homework choice is going to be that. So how do we write context and thesis? And then you can take a look and pause the video here if you want to look at what's happening for the rest of the week. All right, so we have some school shout outs. This is something that we started last year and we really liked it. And as you turn in homework, we will be thinking about your schools uh, to be able to shout out to. So please include that information when you turn things in. So Todd, if you'll move forward, I, I'm gonna be selfish. I'm gonna start by shouting out to my own students um, at Coral Gable Senior High School in Miami, Florida. We are the Cavaliers. Probably good to say that today instead of when we're doing constitutionalism next one. Uh, next lesson, but um, I have amazing students, many of whom I haven't met in person, and so I'm just going to shout out to them. We're also going to shout out to Chaffee High School in Ontario, California. They're the Tigers. We have a dear friend who's a teacher there, Mr. Mercado, and then of course, being uh, our first day, we're going to shout out to Todd's School, which is Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. They are the Lightning. That's a, that's a very cool mascot, the Lightning. Um, and so we just wanted to take today to shout out to our own students um, because we know that we care so much about our own students and your teachers care about you. And this is such a weird year for us to be starting this learning together and getting ready for this test. So um, again, I'm Katie Lancy. Uh, Todd Beach is here. We're so happy that you're here with us and we hope that we can be really useful to you as we are together these next few, uh, this next couple of weeks. Thanks a lot for paying attention today. We appreciate it. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care.